right, this morning we are going to, we're in chapter 14 of Gonzalez's book, um, looking at Eusebius of Caesarea, not to be confused with Eusebius and Nicomedia, which I'm sure you guys are wondering <laughs> about. It's different, you've struggled between that and, you know, Clement of Alexandria and Clement of Rome, you know, which Eusebius are we talking about this morning? Um, actually, we will talk about... Eusebius and Nicomedia in another lesson. So this is a different Eusebius. Um, isn't it amazing that back there they didn't have names. It was of where you lived or some association or whatever. Uh, wouldn't it be tough? There's Bob. Uh, which Bob? They didn't have last names. No, not usually. They might have family names occasionally, but most of the time it was just your name or your titles or your association. So yeah, it's a very, very different world. See, my, my last name, Wilson, is very creative, Will's son. So <laughs> we come from a creative stock of naming people. Uh, Did you not want any like, names like Baker and Cooper? They weren't Martinis. Yeah, so Baker, Baker and yeah. Baker. Bob the Cooper, Cooper yep. the, yeah. The yeah, carpenter. the carpenter, yeah. It's, it's very interesting how, how naming becomes. So this is Eusebius of Caesarea. And Caesarea is in Israel. in Israel, and there's multiple Caesareas, yes. <laughs> it's the one on the coast, yes. Philip ended up there, right? Yes. Okay, so that's the Caesarea we're talking about. And Caesarea, of course, is talking about the town of Caesar. It was Caesar's thing. They, they named the town after Caesar, uh, which is actually also a title, not a name. Uh, isn't it pretty amazing? That was a title named after somebody who was being flattered in an area that, whatever. Um, so names are quite fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is you know, I've seen pictures of it, and you've been there. It's very, very nice. So this morning, that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at Eusebius of Caesarea. And the thing that's most important about, before we dive into him, is this is the transition time period we've talked about, and, and Jason mentioned it in our last lesson. This is a transition time when the church was persecuted to where the quote-unquote church, and I'm going to use that term loosely, is favored and dominant. That is going to create some very interesting situations. It is going to have some good things. It's going to have some bad things. It's going to have all sorts of situations that are, that are going to um, set the tone for the next oh, 13, 1400 years. Uh, and it's slow and it's transitional, just like we talked about. You know, you start with one, one degree off and, you know, you end up with, with different, different outcomes. The other thing that I think this lesson is going to point out is how easy we all, and again, this isn't these guys, we are all susceptible to our time and culture and how we interpret and see things within that culture. Right. Unfortunately, those of us from the United States are very parochial. Well, of course, the rest of the world's just like us. That's why we're the ugly Americans when we go across. How come you don't have this? And why don't you have this? And where's my, you know, that that's not the world. Matter of fact, we, as I've mentioned before, we live in Disney World here. The reality we live in is vastly different. And what we're going to see here is the reality for the church in this time period of Eusebius is going to change markedly. Uh, it goes from a marginal to persecuted group into the power group. It's going to go from the state sort of don't ask, don't tell, and we'll kill you if somebody says something bad to a situation where suddenly it's cool to be a Christian. Matter of fact, you need to be a Christian if you want to advance in society. And these types of things are going to have tremendous impact on the way the church operates. And on page one of your notes, I want to just sort of, before we dive into Eusebius himself, launch off some of the stuff Jason talked about last week and some of the things that we're going to see into the future uh, of what this time period meant. And matter of fact, Eusebius is the guy who really helps um, eloquently cement the, a lot of this thinking, whether he realized it or not. Okay, there's a lot of other people who thought this way. He was just a good writer. He was a scholar. He has influence on people. And um, I'm going to talk about his book here uh, in a minute. But in the middle of, your, in the middle of the, you know, page one of your notes, I've got a couple of things I want to just point out. 
First off, the structure and practices of the church are going to change and they're going to fall in line or very close to in line in most cases, not all, with the imperial Roman Empire. And you're like, now that's a big change. You're thinking about people hiding in catacombs and small little congregations and other things to now suddenly you become in line with imperial Rome slash Constantinople type of imperial. Now, this is why it's referred to typically as the imperial church age that we're going to talking about. We're entering the imperial age of the church because it's under, under the Roman or, again, Byzantine empires. What's going to change? Okay, dress and access to clergy. Before it was just us guys hanging around doing the same thing as you. It changes to completely much more ornate dress. All those things that we see and we associate with, you know, high church, Catholic church, you know, Greek Orthodox, the robes and the headdress, all that. That's all imperial stuff. That has nothing to do with the church said, hey, this is a good idea to dress up our bishops or our, our priests or pastors or whatever in this garb. This was... Hey, this is what the what the empire does to honor people, and this should be how we should do it. And we're honoring God because He's the King. You know, logical path, right? And so, the access to the clergy, as we're going to see, uh, before it was kind of amongst the people. Then it becomes, hey, I'm part of an organization and a structure and a power and administration, and and so we need to do our thing, and you know, everybody else sort of gets in line with the process because that's how the Roman Empire ran. Very imperial. Participation of the congregation. It was much more participatory earlier on. Later on it becomes we speak, you listen kind of an approach. Um, the structure of the churches themselves. Before, buildings were not common. Not saying they did not exist because we do know that some church buildings did exist, but church buildings become imperial buildings not just people local you know got their money together and did this stuff this becomes actually the government building the churches and they did not build them on small scales they built them on very grand scales they used a a structure referred to as a basilica which is what eventually the church adopted as the name of churches these are basilicas okay that was just a, an architectural style uh, the practice of worship all of those ceremonies, choirs and candles and censers and incense and all that kind of stuff, the procession, that was all imperial. It wasn't people said, hey, let's just make this up. They said, well, if we honor the, the emperor this way, we certainly should honor God this way, right? Again, logical. We want to make it holy. We want to make it grand. We want to show that we love God, right? Bob? Bob? Well, that was the easy link was between the Old Testament priesthood because, again, when you, if you pull all that stuff forward, it makes it really simple to, to bring that Old Testamental temple type of idea in, even though the New Testament church was never like that. But it makes it very easy. See, this is what they did. See, this is what they did. And there's, there's an argument for it. I mean, a place of worship was considered... You know, it's okay to, to look nice. The question is, how far does look nice go? And, of course, that's everybody's opinion, right? I believe we should have dray grab walls and concrete block, right? And if that's all you have, that's wonderful. See, it's not necessarily a matter of what is or isn't. But this is the impact of that imperial idea. And, yes, they could very easily... We can all justify pretty much anything we want to justify, right? Just look hard enough, you can pretty much justify anything. Um, the interaction and oversight by the of the church by the state. Okay? You know, we, we, we're all church-state separation. You guys realize that's pretty much a novel concept. In most of history, the state oversaw everything or the church or the religious group oversaw everything. They were intertwined in most cultures and still are in most cultures. Only when it's been forced apart, naturally people put their religion, their faith, their, their practice together. 
I mean, if you, if you understand Islam, Islam is social, political, economic, and religious, all one system. There is no distinguishing it. So the radical Islamists who go, hey, why aren't you doing this by the, the Quran and the, the Sharia laws and all that? They're perfectly correct according to their own faith. Don't let anybody fool you otherwise. It's the people who accommodate and place separation of, of Islam and state are the ones that are failing in their faith. So when they get accused of that, it's true. I like it better that way, but it's still true. So these, this whole idea of how the state and the church interact is going to have profound effects, in particularly councils and the emperor getting involved. We're going to see that. Um, and... And this is something Eusebius really sort of fostered, not saying he did it alone, but he fostered it, was the notion of the theology shift, and this is we'll talk about this in a minute, between Christ's return in his coming kingdom, and we have arrived with the kingdom and the empire of Rome. It's almost a post, what we would consider today a post-millennial idea. Thing God has been doing all this stuff, and look, we're going into this grand and glorious time. And at that particular time, that probably would look pretty good. And we're going to see how Eusebius saw that. But that's a theologic shift. If your emphasis is on peace and unity and Rome, and God's proving that you know He has successfully got the church in this power with this government in this amazing empire, versus hey, we're waiting for the return of Christ and His kingdom. That's a major theology shift. And we see a lot of those elements even in our society today. If we just elect a Christian Congress and just elect a Christian government and just elect a whatever, and look, it'll all change. Isn't it the same idea? It's that same kind of thinking. There's nothing wrong with having a Christian governor, and there's nothing wrong with having a Christian president, but where, where, where's, the, where's the heart really? It's in the people in the country not the government. But when you merge those two ideas together and you see one is proof of support of the other, you're going to have a very big shift in the way you think about stuff and what you do and what you get involved in and how you serve. Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wanting Christian leaders. It's praise God if we do. But that this is one of the things that Eusebius is going to push. Um, now, with all of those types of changes, we're also going to see some positive and negative reactions to it, all right? Think about this. If you're that faithful person in this small church with whatever, and you're, you've been faithful and even been uh, hurt or persecuted or, or whatever, and the person down the street who was the one who did the accusation and caused the problems comes waltzing in going, Hi, I'm a Christian now. They're the rich, they're powerful, the wealthy. You're kind of kind of going, really? Since when did you become a Christian? Well, there's this Constantine guy, and it's kind of important that you kind of fit in with the society, and now that being Christian's cool, I'm a Christian. Some of those conversions may have been truthful. Many of those people were just opportunists because church and state were so intertwined. If you're part of the church, you get the position. Just like before, if you were part of the church, you got pulled out of the military. You got pulled out of officialdom. You got pulled out of stuff. Now, if you're part of the church, it's now a positive thing. Well, people are going to have different kinds of reactions to that. And this is where we're going to see um, the monastic movements. We're going to see those here shortly. The monastic movements begin in earnest. And they start with the hermits, and then they go to the more communal type of uh, monastery type of an idea that we think of traditionally. Um, the other thing that we're going to see is the church and the state in the East and the West are going to interact differently. In the West, the church becomes the dominant power over the state. In the East, the state remains the authority over the church. And over time, that creates changes until I think the great schism of, what is it, 10, either 54 or 56, I can't remember, between the East and the Western churches completely separate. They don't even talk to each other anymore. They pronounce anathema on each other. 
And there's a lot of implications. When the church gets involved with the state and the state with the church, somebody wins. In the east, it was the state. In the west, it was the church. Um, that's why it was such a big deal when Napoleon took the crown from the pope and took it and crowned himself. That was a huge thing. That was a statement of, I am, we as France are no longer under the authority of the Catholic Church, I, Napoleon. I mean, there's other things, but that was a huge symbolic thing. It happened earlier, too, but that was a big deal when Napoleon did that. Before, it was always the Pope, as the leader of the Church, crowning the Emperor. So you see a whole bunch of sh shifts that are going to happen. Um, practices of resolving a theologic debate are going to change. Because now the Emperor is going to call councils and call the church leaders together. And he is the one who's presiding over those councils. Is he an elder? Is he trained in theology? Does he know anything about theological issues? Not necessarily, and most often, no. But he's the one who calls and has the influence. So if the emperor, who you want to stay in good graces with, is the one overseeing your council, might have a small effect on how things work. Plus, politics, who wins, who loses, who gets what positions, blah, 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 blah. It continues on from there. Um, and again, this is going to create what in the congregant's mind of the leadership of the church? Is everybody going to believe the same thing that, you know, it's okay for the emperor to be doing this and the state to be doing this? No. And there's other people going to say, hey, that's perfectly reasonable. This is great because... God has blessed us, and this is a proof that, see, the church and the state, and we're going to go into this great, wonderful time of church and state and godly Christians and all that kind of stuff, right? That's going to create problems of who has what kind of authority and who do you listen to in the church. And when you have debates over stuff, well, we need to call the emperor and get a council formed, and the council's going to do this, and the other people are going, whoa, 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 wait a second here. What happened to my pastor? What happened to the local church? What happened to that? And you're going to have problems with how do you practice even being a Christian within that context. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this changes how people believe God's plan is being carried out. And we're going to talk about that. Because God does work in history. But if you mix the wrong components and go too far, you create all sorts of issues. Does all make sense? This is a profound change. This is like a pivot point in the history of church. And every one of these things is God is blessing the church, and yet with the blessing comes problems. I mean, isn't it better to be able to freely practice your faith than it is to have to hide in a hole? I mean, it helps your evangelism a lot, except when people come in and then it's now all because... I'm not a believer, but it's the cool thing to do. I mean, don't we see that today? So sometimes God's persecution is great at purifying, but it is difficult with other aspects. And sometimes God's blessing, from you know that perspective, you know we're free. We, it's very easy to get lulled into believing what is important. I think I and when I opened the introduction to this class, we talked about. You know, C.S. Lewis talked with in screw tape letters, wormwood and screw tape, talking that you know you you your your error was you let your your uh, patient quote unquote become merely Christian. They need to be Christian with a cause or Christian with a difference. Well, this is where you start seeing Christian with a difference become blurred together, and that's where you can get led astray very very fast. The fundamentals of why are we here and what are we about? We're about the glory of God and preaching the gospel. And yes, in the process, there may be some societal change and whatever, but it's through the change of the heart and through our blessing to others, not, hey, this is how we get people elected, right? Nothing, again, nothing wrong with that. But where's our what, Christians with the difference, you know, versus Christian? And I encourage you to vote, please. We need something. I don't know what it is, but what we're getting is not really very pleasing. But why is that? So we get we elect what reflects who we are. Okay, 
That's why we need to be more about being Christian. I know, it's really bad. Yeah. And yeah, we, 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 are, we are electing those who reflect our society. And what, what's the only thing that changes hearts? It's not politics. It's not votes. It's the gospel. That's what our, our role is. That's what the church's role is. But it's going to shift because it now becomes easy to be a Christian. You don't have three years of training and teaching and you can't, you know, take communion until, you know, because you walk in and say, I believe. They say, cool. Don't have to worry about raising money because the churches are being built by the state. It's really amazing what happens with all of this shift. Okay, now that's a lot of setup of what has come before, what Jason talked about last week with all of the emperors fighting each other and all that stuff, and what we're going to see in the future. Eusebius is the guy who sits right in the middle and records most of this. Now, the thing that's, that's most important, if you will, from our perspective in the, that time is this book. Oh, good catch. Yeah, it's slippery. This is called Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History or Church History. This is the first church history book. Okay, this is a translation, of course. This is 50% of everything we know about the first three centuries of Christianity. Actually, it's not hard to read at all. It's just not written in a form that we are the most familiar with. It's not bad. I mean, yeah. Let me read you just Book 5, Chapter 1, the introduction. This is the preliminary, Book 5, Chapter 1. It says, Soter, Bishop of Rome, died after having held the episcopate eight years. He was succeeded by Eleutherus, the twelfth in order from the apostles. Hmm, interesting. Remember, succession and all was dealing with the Gnostic heresies. This was very important to record who this guy was, and he was in succession. Say, see, no secret knowledge. Um, it was from. It was also the seventeenth year of the reign of the Emperor Antonius Versa, when a more violent persecution broke out against our brethren in certain parts, occasioned by insurrections in the cities. Insurrections in cities. Anybody seen those recent? Um, it is more probable that the innumerable martyrs obtained the crown of eminence in conflict from the events that happened in a single nation. So in other words, see, martyrdom, eminence, you know, it's a blessing. It, um, these, as worthy of imperishable remembrance, were also handed down to posterity and historical records. The full account of these is given in our history of, mar of martyrs, comprising not only historical narrative, but also which may contribute to edification. Uh, whatever may be the reference to our present purpose, I shall here select for the present. Others, indeed, who compose historical narratives would record nothing but victories and battles, trophies of enemies, and warlike achievement of generals, the bravery of soldiers, sullied in blood, and innumerable murders for the sake of children, country, and property. But our narrative embraces the conversion, conversation and conduct which is acceptable to God. The wars and conflicts of the most pacific character. Remember, pacifism was very big in Christianity at the time. Um, whose ultimate tendency is to establish peace of the soul as well as those who have manfully contended for the truth rather than their country and who have struggled for piety rather than their dearest friends. Such as these narratives would engrave on imperishable monuments. The firmness of the champions of, for the true religion their fortitude and their endurance in, of innumerable trials, their trophies erected over demonic agencies, their victories over invisible antagonists, and the crowns that have been placed upon all these, it would proclaim and perpetuate by an everlasting remembrance. Okay? Not your classic uh, history book. <laughs> but this is his preliminary introduction to Book 5, Chapter 1. And there's, it, I mean, it's very interesting if you want to go back and read and find out more about how they thought, what they're doing. The key about Eusebius is most of this is written to a purpose, like all history. If you write a diplomatic history, you're recounting the diplomatic stuff. If you write a military history, it's about military stuff. This is about how God is working in history through the church to ultimately demonstrate that the succession of Constantine and Christianity is God saying, look, we're blessed. This is proof we have conquered. We won. God won. 
and then now it's about the kingdom of God through the Roman Empire. Shift. Not a bad shift necessarily, but not a correct shift either. Right? This book and the histories that followed has a massive influence on people. So 50% of everything you know about the first three centuries of the church is right there. Yeah. Matter of fact, you can probably get a lot of them online for free. I just happen to keep that one because I like history. Uh, it's kind of a very interesting read, but again, it reads very differently than what you're used to reading. Because again, he collected information and edited it. He was not necessarily an original composer. So, who was Eusebius? Who was this guy? Um, he was born around 260 AD, some mid-late um, third century, early fourth century, because he went through the time of Constantine, past Constantine's death. Um, he, we don't know much about his early life. We don't know about his conversion. We don't know about his parents. Very little information is known about that. We do know that eventually he becomes the bishop or the, the leading pastor, if you will. Because remember, bishop was just is another word for pastor. We just don't use that because of some of the ecclesiastical you know, stuff that goes along with it. But they call them bishops um, or that equivalent. Um, and he eventually becomes the, the bishop of Caesarea. That's why he's Eusebius of Caesarea. And he came under the influence of a gentleman named uh, a Pamphilus of Caesarea when he was a young man. And Pamphilus was a guy who was trained. Uh, he was originally from what's modern day Beirut. It was not called Beirut, it was Bir Birak or something like that at the time. But modern day Beirut, that's the same city of this time, still exists. Um, and he studied in Alexandria. Anybody remember what came out of Alexandria? What kind of thinking? What kind of hermeneutical approach? Anybody remember? We'll get to it, but again, this allegorical, yeah. So we have the allegorical school of interpretation. Well, an allegorical school is going to see things more in symbols and imagery and, and stuff like that. It'll be less concrete. Well, if a guy who is trained in that under Origen, who was Pamphilus' teacher, and takes the stuff and, and guess where, where Origen's library ended up? In Caesarea. Okay. Um, and good old um, Eusebius is trained under this man who is, is confident along with some other people. They, they start studying. He's very academic. He's a very intellectual kind of guy. Um, they collaborated on a bunch of works that don't exist uh, anymore, but we know about them that they, they did exist. Um, but in 303, okay, so now Eusebius is now 43 years old approximately. So he's not a young man. He's been trained up, raised up under this guy. It breaks up under Diocletian. Remember, that was the, the things we talked about uh, last time. Um, Pamphilus and many others associated with this work in ministry are martyred. Now, we don't, I'm not going to go into all the details about their martyrdom, but you know, the guy was actually in jail for like two years before... You know, it sort of calmed down, and then they went, oh, we're going to kill you, and they then killed him. Because uh, remember Galerus and uh, all those other guys that Jason talked about last week? The, the, the chaos, remember, where were they? They were in the east where the most severe persecution in Turkey, you know, along the Mediterranean coastline, that's where some of the most severe persecution was because that's where the guys were die hard. We don't like the Christians, and that's where most Christians were. That's where Pamphilus was. That's where Eusebius was. Now, Eusebius did not get killed. Uh, records indicate that he went on several trips during this time and may, may, may have been trips to escape from being involved in being a martyr because by this time, people kind of went, okay, I can stand here, lead with my chin, and say, hit me. Or I can go, this is stupid. I'm out of here. I'm going to go someplace else while they're you know, acting nuts, and then I'll come back and I can watch my flock. Or since he wasn't actually a pastor at that time, well, he became a pastor at that time. But it, it's really, again, there's a, those problems. Do I stay? Do I die? Do I go? Do I come back? But at this particular time, remember, after that long period of peace, people were like, get out of there, Eusebius. So if that's what, he, what happened, or he might have just been in God's providence away at the time when some of this stuff happened. Not sure. 
But the fact is, Pamphilus dies, Eusebius does not. Eusebius actually surpasses Pamphilus. Now, if you are a person who has been trained in an allegorical interpretation, what are you going to see ultimately when Constantine becomes the victor? You're going to see Pilgrim's Progress, right? You're going to see, look, and God did this, and here it is, and he's freed us, and this is the sign and the symbol, because look, he's working through history. Christianity won. If you've read Irenaeus, you'll realize that he, he po points that God is preparing through all of these events and all these situations for those to know him, which is true. Remember we talked about early on the spread of the gospel? Roman roads, Roman peace, Ro Greek language, all those other things, the establishment of synagogues. God was working through history to do all this stuff, which is true. But when you say, I now can tell you exactly what God is doing and had God has done and this is proof of what God has done, that's where you kind of go, how much do you really know about what God's really doing? Have you ever noticed the bad things that happen turn into good and the good things and bad? Usually, usually whatever you think is happening good is usually there's going to be some you know downside to it and something bad there's an upside to it. And so Eusebius gets sucked into a lot of this stuff. And that's what he's going to, of course, very easily see in historical events. And see, that's one of the dangers of history, is it's always written from a particular perspective. And you see it within the context of which you live. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, in, in, in World War I, the, the Germans, you know, in the trench warfare and all that other horrible stuff, they went, well, at least it's not the Thirty Years' War. And you're going mustard gas, blowing up people, et cetera. At least it's not the Thirty Years' War. That was their perspective. Hey, this isn't so bad. It's not the Thirty Years' War. And when we get to the Thirty Years' War, you'll find out how horrible that was. And 30 or 40 percent of the German countryside was killed. So at least it's not the Thirty Years' War. Yeah. Perspective. You've been persecuted. You've just gone through Diocletian. You've just gone through all these horrible things. And who's the emperor that's going to save you? Constantine. And he does, in a sense. So, the thing that Eusebius gets accused of a lot is being the champion of Constantine and being, you know, he's the guy who, who's the Christian emperor. Well, the reality is, yes, he does say some very glowing things about Constantine. And if you stand back and look at our time and culture, you're like, wow, this guy's just a flatterer. He's just flattering Constantine to death. That is until you read other things about the emperor and what other people said about the emperor, and you go, eh, it was about normal. So in other words, what he wrote to us looks flattering. What he wrote in that time is just normal language. So again, see, sometimes what we read in one thing, if you pull it out of its cultural context, you miss the point that this was the way you spoke about emperors, right? It's just normal language. Happens today. Yeah, happens like today. In other languages and cultures, you have to be slow, slower with language to get an exchange. Yeah. It's just too weird and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, even in, in Great Britain. And the Queen's, you know, monarch of this and ruler of that and, you know, consort of whoever. And we're like, eh, it's the Queen. Because we don't have the Queen. You know, like, whatever. In our culture, that's what we'd say, but in another culture, if you didn't do it that way, you're being disrespectful. So here you see the same type of thing. So when you read people say, oh, Eusebius was um, you know, a flatterer of Constantine and favored Constantine, yeah, he did, but he saw it from a completely different perspective. Um, the problem is, is if you look at what I've been saying about how he viewed church and, and the proof of what's happening, He's going to tend to be locked into a set of presuppositions in his thinking. He's also, therefore, going to overlook the bad things, the stuff that does not fit into your data pattern, right? Look, it's going this way. Well, there's 19 pieces of data that says it's going that way. Yeah, I don't like looking at those. Yeah, it's going this way, right? And we all do that, don't we? we, we, we that's why we say we fool ourselves. I should have seen it. It's like, of course, it was sitting right in front of you, but you didn't like seeing that, so you ignored it. Well, that's kind of what Eusebius does. 
didn't fit his pattern. He just ignored it. Unfortunately, he was not alone. Most people in this time thought exactly like Eusebius. Not all, but most. If you find yourself on the side of the majority, question yourself. Sorry. At least ask the question. You may be right. More often than not, you're not. There's something you're missing. Uh, or at least you need a temporary. Now, during this time, he becomes very influential, especially in his region. He eventually is going to become the bishop of um, Caesarea. Um, and he is more interested in peace and harmony and unity and prosperity and things going well for the Christian church than he is theology. Okay, it's not, He's not a theologian, but he's much more of a practical guy, historian guy, rather than a theology guy. But if you are influential and well-known and people look to you and you get confused on a theologic issue, what does that do to the people that you are shepherding or people who look to you? They get confused. And we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. During this particular time, the Ari what's referred to as the Arian heresy dealing about the deity of Christ comes up. And Eusebius is kind of wishy-washy on one thing. When it gets to the Council of Nicaea, remember that's one of those things that comes up. The Council of Nicaea, he goes, yes, I agree the Arians are heretics and then after the council he kind of goes well i'm not so i'm kind of confused a little now i can tell you that that is a theologically challenging thing and if your top theologians have a challenge with it what do you think is going to happen to the common folks who are not theologians going to get confused they're going to maybe lose confidence they're going to go what's going on here um, I, 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 Greg loves to quote one of Spurgeon's comments about if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pews. Well, there was a mist in the pulpit on this topic and there became a fog in the pews. Um, and that's kind of what ends up happening with some of his credibility in this time theologically. And again, these are not easy things. You've got to know what you're doing. It's not just, oh, they're wrong. You've got to prove it. You've got to say scripturally, why is this right? Why is this wrong? All right, it's, it's, and it's challenging, I, I can tell you that. Um, so, again, these are going to affect the way people see things and the way he sees stuff. Don't want to go there. Uh, sorry. Sometimes I say things that I, I don't want to go to waste time on. Um, if you believe that the Christianization of the Roman Empire is the pinnacle of history, what is going to happen? And you see all these people coming in to the church. What is going to happen to the church, its operations, its thinking, and its behavior? Because this is what Eusebius saw. This is, you will see, reflected in his work. What is going to happen? This is a test because we see the same things today. Different forms, different things. Some of it's positive, some of it's not. What do you think is going to happen in people's thinking? We've what? We've become like those we praise. Okay. We Yeah, if we look at if we look at here's the government, it's becoming Christian. This is what we think is great and wonderful, and it's proof proof of God's work. We will start emulating that because if that's what was good and what God used, therefore we ought to look like that, right? What else? Yeah, the, yeah. Church, church, and state become so intertwined that that there becomes really actually domains, and we're going to see this later, that the church excommunicates, but we're not going to kill anybody. Oh, by the way, uh, can you guys go kill them? Sure, okay. Or vice versa. We don't agree with this theologic thing, so we're going to make a law that declares all those people heretics. Right? 
And now the state has declared your sect or your disagreement as heretical. Hmm, does this have anything to do with the Reformation? See how far this impact goes? Yeah. So we should be glad that that we're not made violent for that. Yeah, we should be glad we're, we're yeah. Going down in the future. Yes, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, when things are difficult, you know, there's a lot more purity. And, of course, what now are you going to do if things are going good and all sorts of impurities coming into the church? What's your reaction? You either accept it or you go away. We're going to go start the pure church of Christianity, not this polluted imperial church. We're going to get rid of all those things, right? And what do you see during the Reformation? Iconoclasts and iconoduels, worship, image worshipers, strip it all down, throw it away, burn it. Can't have anything pretty, can't have anything nice because you'll start worshiping it. See, these battles continue. This very time period, these types of issues will follow the church to today. In other countries, you see it. In this country, you see it. Through time, you see it. And it bounces back and forth. So again, let me ask you this. Are we asking the right questions? Are we looking at the right situation when we say, look, we're blessed because things are going well. Is that true? We're cursed. Things are not going well. What's the real question that we have to do instead of looking at our circumstances and situations, which is what Eusebius and these people did? What's the real question we should be asking? Who's in control? What's that? What is our position and relationship with God? What is our mission? To change the government? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Yeah, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we're going to, what is the task that the Lord gave us to do? Make disciples, teaching them all things I've commanded you, to observe all things I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way to the end of the age. That's our mission. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to be about. And oh, by the way, as you're going along, you should be making a a positive impact on society. They should see grace. They should see mercy. They should see kindness. They should see love. They should see all those things. But that's a result of, not because of. And if things are going bad in the country against Christianity, it goes bad. If it's going good, it goes good. But that never changes our mission. That never changes whether God's blessing us or not. This is an easy trap to get caught into, though, isn't it? It's so simple. Yeah, it makes life easier. The, yeah. Evangelism. Look how great our evangelism is. Our church tripled in size over the last three months. We must have, you know, those seeds we planted four years ago must have really took root. Or maybe the government changed its policies and now we're not illegal and not going to be persecuted and the emperor is Christian and everybody comes wandering in. Now, you, of course, can leave or you can say, hey, what a fertile field for evangelism. They're coming to us. What did Paul do? He went to the synagogues first. Well, we don't even have to go to the synagogues. They're coming to the church. Let's evangelize them. Let's be faithful in what we need to do. Maybe half of them still aren't saved, but the Lord said there's going to be wheat and tares. Or you can say, you know what? This is just so bad. It's so awful. I don't want to have any association with it. I mean, think about it. If you were in a church that the gospel was not preached at all, I'm not saying that that was true at this time, what would be your tendency to want to go do go somewhere else and if you couldn't find anything in your local area what would you want to do move or start another church or a house church or something and see this is the dilemma that's now going to start happening do i go out into the desert so i can honor god do i get together with other like-minded believers do i what do i do and now you've now started another church which of course makes you a schismatic right and guess what? We're going to see schisms and isms and all sorts of stuff pop up. So everybody's ready to go out and vote and make sure we get a Christian nation again, right? <laughs> Not that we ever had one, folks. Um, and see, one of the things Gonzalez mentions in the book, and I want to point this out that I do not agree. Uh, I understand what he's saying, but I don't agree with this, is he said that the gospel was primarily for the poor. 
because he's a very social, he's got a lot of social gospel in his background. It, it, yeah, so, I mean, if, if you're looking to reach out, because, I mean, you, you love the poor, you want to help them, he looks at it and says, well, the early church was all for the poor. Well, the, the fact is, this is where he, he brings his 21st century stuff into that time. Most people were poor then. Okay. Except for the powerful. There was no middle class. So this is an over-reading of modern society and culture over the top of what's going on there. The gospel's for everybody. Yes, wealth and power are a stumbling block because we think we have it all. But I don't know about you, but poor people are just as stubborn to the gospel as rich people. You know, we have just as many lost people sitting in Highlands Ranch as in the poor sections of downtown Denver. But we, of course, go, oh, well, they can have access. These guys can't. It's like, they're just as stubborn. They're just as blind. They're just as deluded. They're just deluded by wealth versus deluded by whatever others are. It's not about your socioeconomic situation. So I think, you know, Gonzalez, again, reading in there, you kind of go, well, I understand where he's coming from, but, but, but he's reacting against the wealth and powerful. And, of course, if you were in a church that the wealth and powerful were the ones that were oppressing you, didn't the Bible talk about that? Didn't Paul talk about that? Weren't these the wealthy ones that were oppressing you? Mm-hmm. Same thing. He saw that wealth and power coming into the church as proof of God's blessing. That's not biblical. Um, the magnificent churches. Wouldn't it be nice if the, if the state built this building and, and did it for us and doesn't cost us anything? Could use our money and resources elsewhere. Wouldn't it be wonderful? They'd be able to control us. Hmm, let's see. Federal government money given to the states for education. Let's see. What comes after that? Oh, wait a second. If you want my money, you got, you know. But also, say they didn't even do that. It's going to be built on an imperial scale because you're going to have imperial architects coming in with imperial money, with imperial governmental structures, with imperial administration and bureaucracy because that's how you get to. So what does the churches do? They just sort of latch on to that. Hey, it works for the empire. It must going to work for us. And then you have corporate CEO-run churches. You have finance committees that look at the church as a business, not a ministry. I can tell you, if you look at church as a business, you will run your finances very differently than if you look at it as a ministry. Now, I'm not talking about taking a leap of faith. I'm talking steps of faith. There's a balance between those things. We don't care. We'll do whatever. God will bless us. Yeah there's the difference between trusting God and testing God, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll run all sorts of campaigns and you'll have to get money and you'll have to do that because that's what businesses do. Fortunately, at this point, with nonprofit status, you're allowed to be a nonprofit, and there's certain benefits. If they took it away, they take it away, just like with your tax deduction for a home. But they don't have any way right now. They have no way right now of getting you. But I can, I can tell you one thing. The government can get us anytime they want. It does, takes no effort whatsoever on their part. They could walk in here and shut us down and... They could have some, somebody could walk in here and, and start a fight. They could create a crime scene, say, until we finish investigating, you guys can't come back. And the police department's overburdened, and therefore, it may be three years before you can come back. Have fun. Trust me. I would make a great evil emperor. Because uh, it's easy to manipulate. It's easy to control. And the government can do it. Anybody can do it. This is where we trust God. We live in these situations. And by the way, whether you're a 501c3 or not, by definition as a church, you are a 501c3. It's just whether you have official recognition or unofficial recognition. So by law, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. Going to stop here. But do you see the ramifications of how we need to be thinking and the easy traps that we can fall into? And again, Eusebius is a godly man who loves the Lord, who cares about people, who wants to serve and minister. He was a faithful overseer of his flock. He did everything that you would want a guy to do. 
And yet, like anybody, like all of us, it's easy to get trapped into our time and culture and thinking. It's so simple. And we need to hold fast to what we believe, but we also have to have an open enough hand to say, I could be wrong. And when you have that kind of heart, that's called a teachable and humble spirit. Because things that I know I grew up with or things I know I was taught when I was younger, I held to tenaciously until somebody said, mm, what about that? Huh. Now, had I held to it tenaciously, I wouldn't have learned anything. Versus going, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Let's look at it. One of the things I have found the most effective way of learning is presume you're wrong. Start with what I believe is absolutely correct and I'll die on. Presume I'm wrong. Now, usually I come back to, no, I wasn't. Okay, because what I'm willing to die on is pretty straightforward stuff. But just presume that in any situation. Learn. And you'll find out how God uses that, again, for the gospel, for what we're supposed to be doing, not getting wrapped up in some of this other stuff. That stuff changed the church for, from then till now. And it was massive in the Reformation. These were the very fights that went on because of just that change in thinking. It's amazing how simple little things have such far-reaching impacts. Okay, we will pick up with some more uh, schisms and isms and other kinds of things uh, next week and um, what, again, starts falling out of this time period because this is the same thing, councils and all that stuff. All right, let's pray.